It's useful to explain something about the affiliations on the bottom of this, this slide because it explains my, my position and, wh and where I'm looking at the world from because what this talk's really about is, if you like, what researchers are up to. Now, the, the position that I observe the research ecosystem from is 50% of me directing this thing, the Oxford E-Research Centre. I know I'm not the only E-Research Director, Centre Director in the room. Um, so the Oxford E-Research Centre is a centre of about 60 multidisciplinary people in Oxford, and we support research across all departments I in Oxford. That's the role. Um, effectively, we have a national role as well, because originally, 10 years ago, there were a number of e-science centres around the country, and we're now the... I th it, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is an official line, but probably the biggest uh, still existing centre uh, in the UK. Um, but the other half of me is this thing. Um, I am the director, uh, an overly grandiose title, director, uh, the National Strategic Director for Digital Social Research for the Economic and Social Research Council, which means I look after a funding program. Um, so half of me is research council and half of me is running a research centre. That's a really interesting position to be in because I'm seeing researchers from both sides of the table, if you like. So that's my, my uh, position. This um, ESRC role came out of the uh, UK uh, e-science programme and where, where this council continues to invest uh, in, in this area and sort of renamed to digital social research. Right, I'm happy to talk about any of those things in much more detail at any time over the next two days, but let's press on um, with my perspective on things. So really playing to our big data and e-science theme. Um, if we go back to 10 years, over 10 years, to the beginning of the UK e-science program and effectively e-science programs elsewhere and cyber infrastructure in the US, as we've heard from Dan, uh, actually it was pretty much predicated on this big data thing. So we've been doing big data for a while, but it was very specifically big scientific data. And the classic example, of course, then was the, the Large Hadron Collider. And when you, when you look now at the sort of data figures we were talking about then, which were impressive then, they don't seem so big now. But that, that you know, it's, it's not like um, big data is as big as it's ever going to be. It continues to get bigger. The new infrastructure 10 years hence will be, for example, the um, Square Kilometre Array Radio Telescope, which is, is the thing that people are focusing on now as the major IC infrastructure in, in, in science. So really, the UK science program was pretty much predicated on the big data thing. In fact, that, that was a strategic decision early on. Uh, the US was very um, computation and, and supercomputer rich in comparison to the UK, and we went for the big data thing. Perhaps we should have called it big data analytics rather than e-science, because that would make sense to everyone, and we'd be doing what it says on the tin. And now, uh, there's loads of data. <laughs> And it's across all disciplines, and it's pervading our um, sort of whole uh, research life cycle. Um, this is actually a slide from uh, Christine Borgman. When you see these little tags come up like this, it's the person that I'm uh, giving credit for the slide, rather than labeling this red column as Christine Borgman. Anyway. Um, this is uh, really, uh, you know, people, it's like, it's like it's just been discovered. Everyone's suddenly talking about big data. But no, we've been doing it for a while. So part of the story here is what have we learned? And I think Dan's presentation was very much what have we learned from, from 10 years of cyber infrastructure. And uh, this is a very complimentary presentation in that, in that sense. Now, one of the things that's been um, well documented with respect to this, this shift um, to, towards big data is this, the shift in practice and methodology towards being data-centric and data-intensive. Um, some great examples here. Um, Doug Hill there is actually chief exec of the Bio Research Council in the UK and is also a bioinformatician, biologist, and a uh, uh, spectacularly titled paper I quite like. Here's the evidence, now what's the hypothesis? Really talking about this turnaround to be, to be data-led. Um, quite controversially, Wired's headline, The End of Theory, which we could debate over a drink later. Um, Microsoft and, and the Jim Gray legacy of the fourth paradigm. But one thing I wanted to say about all this uh, quite well documented methodology shift, uh, and this talk is in some senses about shifts, is that it's very strange to some of my audiences to put up a fourth paradigm slide because if I have arts and humanities and social sciences in the audience, they think, why is that the fourth paradigm? Why isn't that the first or the zeroth paradigm? I mean, you know, our, our digital 
humanities archaeology, for example, um, has been data-centric forever. They've been dealing with incomplete data and inconsistency in ways that um, you know, other people are having to learn how to do now. And um, for many social scientists, the primary data is what's in the data archive that's been collected from surveys. So lots to be learned across disciplines. It really has become e-research rather than e-science. Now, one of the things that uh, has been uh, built to help deal with this deluge, and I want to sort of use this as a particular example because I'll come back to it at the end of the talk, is this notion of the, the scientific workflow, the computational workflow, the data analysis pipeline. Um, in all these different systems here, these are graphical representations of data processing. So the data is really flowing in one at the end of these things, going through various steps of computation, of analysis, of simulation, and producing some results. Um, and these have been created multiple times in multiple disciplines and sub-disciplines. Um, perhaps, perhaps it's good that they're relatively easy to build. They're hard to build good systems to support these, but they're relatively easy to build. So a lot of them have been built. And they're intellectual access ramps. Each of these comes out of the box for one particular set of researchers, one community. So it's an easy way onto the, uh, into the, the computational superhighway, if you like, um, or the data superhighway. And this is uh, an example of a couple of things. What, one is that as scientists build these workflows, they're creating something that enables them to do systematic processing of large quantities of data, rather than having to triage that data and guess which bits that they can process might have the results they're looking for. But it also creates a new kind of scientific artifact, because those are records of an experiment. They're also shareable. Uh, and that's the important point here, because one of my themes is, what are the new artifacts? And this is important in the context of discussing publishing, for example. So that's one point here, the, the importance of the workflows. The second point is that there are a whole bunch of systems. Um, and, and again, this, this alludes to what Dan was talking about. Sometimes we've seen a methodology of, of cyber infrastructure and e-infrastructure which you could ca caricature as build it and they will come. And sometimes we've seen things that are very uh, centered around the user experience, if you like. Um, and I think it's right that there are all these systems because each one of these is designed for a particular set of users. Now, that's an important point. It's what in social science we would call co-constitution or co-creation. Um, and the great, great example of this that I want to put up now because it's going to be the hinge for the things I'm going to talk about the rest of the talk is actually the web itself. Because the original definition of e-science in the UK was distributed to global collaboration and the next generation of infrastructure that will enable it. And whatever infrastructures we may have designed and built early on, effectively the web is that infrastructure, whether it's for people talking to people or whether it's machines talking to machines. So it has become the EU infrastructure. And, and I'm going to use that in multiple ways in this talk. So it's a great example of co-creation. This is the BBC web technology page when Tim Berners-Lee got his knighthood and became Sir Tim. And this is the way the media likes to portray inventors. Uh, so the web's inventor gets a knighthood, a dubbed the father of the web, where the web was born over here. Um, he is the creator of the web. Now, Tim didn't actually write all the pages. Right? I think we all know that. The whole point is the web um, wasn't designed by one person. It's something that happened. It was, as we said before, is it you know, science influencing technology or technology influencing science? These things are going hand in hand. It's, uh, it's co-constitution, and in very small print here, I'll read it out. It says, modestly, Sir Tim says his invention was just another program. Right? So Tim is quite modest about this. It's just another program. It's what people did with it. <coughs> and, that, and that theme of, 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 of the people and the technology and the socio-technical ecosystem also pervades this talk. So what I want to do is talk about this notion of doing research on the web from, from four different perspectives, four different ways of parsing that. If I said to someone, what do you do? And they, they said, oh, I do research on the web. It could be any of these four things. Um, first of all, I want to talk about it as I just have, as an infrastructure for research. And I'm choosing an example um, from a, in a digital humanities area deliberately, because I think digital humanities is very interesting because it predates e science, it postdates e science, it's very well embedded, and there's a lot we can learn from there. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the web as a, as a, a source of data, not so much the Large Hadron Collider as the Large People Collider. Right? Um, and then something interesting that's going on now from a social science perspective is a different take on social science, a different take on computer science based on social machines. And I'll, I'll just throw that in briefly on the way through, but then getting to the place which I think is particularly relevant for our discussions in these two days, 
which is how people are using the web for that process of scholarly discourse. Future of research communication. So a very important concept when you're looking at things like the, the co-constitution of the web, um, and, and you can find philosophy literature on this, you can find social science literature, you can find advertising literature. It's the notion of the social object. So uh, a Web2 site is designed around a social object. It's movies on YouTube, it's photos on Flickr, it's visually books on Amazon, slides on SlideShare, and then, well, we want to share these new artifacts that I mentioned earlier, the scientific workflows that people are using to deal with the deluge of data. So we created, as an experiment, um, the, uh, the Web2 site, my experiment, for people to share workflows. And that's been a very interesting process. It isn't obviously on the scale of Facebook or Amazon. It's a niche, boutique sort of site. But we've learned a lot, which I shall um, refer to in the talk. It started off by being billed by new scientists as MySpace for Scientists. This is around 2006. And uh, the trouble is that was too passe. So we started saying Facebook for scientists. But the problem with that is that scientists wouldn't use it because they assumed that everything had to be open in those days. So we then say it's not Facebook for scientists. <laughs> and and th I'd, I'd love to tell you lots more about this, and I'm happy to do it later. But sort of in one slide, depending on my audience, um, the, uh, each of these bullets may be relevant. So OK, it's like Facebook for scientists, but it's different to Facebook. Um, from a repository's viewpoint, it's really interesting because it isn't just a repository of, of data or journals or preprints or whatever. It is um, specifically these methods for doing things with the data. Right? When there's a lot of focus these days on data, this is an emphasis on what you do with it. Okay. Um, from a social networking viewpoint, it's interesting because uh, people are linked up by the things that they're sharing. And actually, those things they're sharing themselves, those workflows, as you've seen, are networks of other stuff. So there's a whole uh, sort of uh, fascinating uh, uh, sort of uh, overlay of networks from a, from a recommendation viewpoint. Um, from a virtual research environment viewpoint, and that's a, the name of a funding program from JISC in the UK, um, it was actually a, very much a social VRE from the outset. It was designed absolutely by the Web2 principles. Um, deliberately at the time in 2007 when we launched um, Not a Portal. Uh, because everyone else was saying, oh, you do it as a portal. I said, no, it's not a portal. It's a Web2 site. This is different. It's part of the experiment. Uh, from a social science viewpoint, it's a fascinating probe into how researchers share and behave. And uh, you know, I can tell you some stories about differences between bioinformaticians and social statisticians in the bar later. Um, uh, from a developer viewpoint, it's an open source app. People can use it significantly. Um, it's, you can use it programmatically use it as a Web2 site that you interact with, but it's very easy to bring that functionality through in other interfaces. So it's about bringing the functionality through to the user, again, the intellectual access ramps, not just uh, bringing the user to the site. And a bunch of other sort of products have, have been influenced by this. So that piece of experience has been very relevant. We've been really exploring the workflow as a social object. And this is what the site looks like, and you know, there's, a, there's a workflow. Two interesting things about this. One is um, that social metadata strip there. What the scientists and researchers wanted is, the, is credit, attribution, licensing. Those are the things that were really important. But the other interesting thing is that our first feature request was that people wanted to attach other things to their workflows. PowerPoint, PDF, um, example input and output data. And that led to this notion of PACs, which I'll come back to later, where we just let people bundle things together however they wanted. And then four years on, we studied what they bundled because they were the, the shared artifacts of digital research that people actually wanted to be using. Something that uses all this technology, these workflows and, and my experiment, is this particular project, which I put up as a, a nice example, um, well, partly because it has the best acronym ever, Structural Analysis of Large Amounts of Music Information. Um, uh, but partly because it sounds very 2001, big data, big machines, big computation, but it actually uses a whole set of methods and ideas which are very you know, 2011 instead. Um, and the idea here basically, uh, and I'd love to talk about this loads more later, is uh, that uh, traditionally musicologists have been working with, with score representations of music, but now there's a whole load of musical performance recordings out there all over the place. Um, we actually use the Internet Archive a lot, but there are lots of others around. You have them on your iPods and your laptops. Um, so there's a huge amount of uh, performance to be analysed. 
And uh, we've come along with some techniques to do that, not just as a one-off, but to put something, something in place the community can continue to use. There's a bit of 2011. And um, basically the problem is going from a signal, in this case a musical signal, through to human understanding of that. And this isn't just saying, oh, there's some sections repeated in this piece of music. This is about the function of those sections. If you listen to a piece of music, your brain is really good at spotting the verse and the chorus, for example. Um, it's actually quite hard by computer. There was lots of open research questions here. But that process of going from a dirty real-world signal through to some understanding, um, I would suggest, is characteristic of a, lot of a lot of what we do in e-research. So the techniques used here are quite uh, generically applicable. What we did in this particular project was to start with digital music collections, in particular with the Internet Archive, and to find out what, quotes, the right answer is to some of this analysis of the structure of music. We um, not so much crowdsourced as student sourced um, analysis of thousands initially of pieces of music. It's more than that with music students in the UK and in Canada. Um, and so that by itself is a fascinating resource. No one's done that sort of annotation on that scale before. We've made that available as linked data uh, so that people can tie that in with, with the other sources they need for their musicological research, which is often about putting things in a historical and a geographical context. So that tells us something about the answers to structure and analysis. Um, but then we have the other side of the story, which is the big crunch, where we use um, a supercomputer, NCSA, to um, actually uh, run algorithms which are generated by the community. Every year, there's this co quotes competition. It's not a competition. They have league tables, but it's not a competition. Um, uh, where people get their algorithms to go 0.1% 0.1 better. Uh, so it's fantastic socio-technical infrastructure in place, uh, maintaining all this code which we're using for the, the structural analysis, which incidentally is running using these workflow systems. So that's a, it's a nice example of the method, methodology of a project. Um, in the end, that's what the annotations look like. I'll skip over that. In the end, we um, will publish that ground truth. That's now available. Uh, we um, are making the structural analyses available. They're beginning to appear now. We're not copying any music. All of this is annotation pointing into music, so this linked data world that we're in is very relevant here. And our model for sustaining this in the future is that there'll be more signal and more community annotation. When I gave this slide at Open Repositories 2010, um, you can tell from the Twitter that I upset people at that point because they wanted the big blue cylinder to be just one of these and get bigger and bigger. Okay? And there is an issue there about... Um, sort of the community sustainability of this versus a, 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 a repository view, which again is something we might want to talk about later. So that's, that's a nice example of a set of things going on, which I would think in many ways are characteristic of, of e-research today. The, the use of crowdsourcing, uh, I'll, I'll say some more about, and um, the, the, the interplay between the, the, the computation and the reuse and the sustainability. That is really uh, that, that movement from signal to understanding, whether that signal was for a sensor network or um, survey data or music or whatever, um, is, is a, gives us this notion of a data scope. Like, like, like telescopes have improved over the years and they cause us to reappraise our notion of where we are in the universe. I think data scopes help us see where we are in the data universe. And again, the instrumentation improves over time. So this is a nice notion. Even though when I talk to any particular discipline, I will tell them they're unique and special. Um, I might secretly go back to my office and think, oh, well, they're very similar to those others over there. And I think what people have in common in the big data world are these data scopes. Everyone's going from signal to understanding. We can share some techniques between these. Uh, the latest thing on the music, this is just from a few days ago. Uh, is we've launched a new citizen science activity on Zooniverse. I don't know if anyone's been following the sort of Zooniverse factory of citizen science projects. It started off with Galaxy Zoo, and then more recently some humanities things like uh, and, and uh, old weather, the digitizing shipping because it's been very, very successful. Uh, so the latest thing on there is called What's the Score at the Bodleian, or WTS internally. Uh, what's the score? And we have these digitized um, manuscripts from the Bodleian Library in Oxford which haven't been, um, haven't been out before, um, which are uh, things like Victorian parlour music. It's like Victorian pop. Um, hasn't been massively studied by musicologists. Uh, we, it's digitised, and we're getting people to, um, to do the metadata transcription to create the electronic catalogue records, uh, but also music transcription. 
Um, it's just launched this a few days ago. You can find the, the website um, if you look for what's the score in Bodley. And don't just look for what's the score because it's entirely about football, uh, <laughs> at least in the UK. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and uh, you can actually do some, do some transcription. And this is based, as I say, uh, on the Zooniverse. It's the latest uh, project that's appearing there. So lots of interest in the humanities now in crowdsourcing. We've got crowdsourcing in the humanities events coming up this month. Um, and it's going to be very interesting to see as people design these, what I would call social machines, um, you know, how they do that and how successful they are. So that's, that's, a, that's an aspect of e-research which we weren't really discussing so much five years ago that's been very significant. It's because of the scale of engagement of people with the web. It's again coming back to that web thing. And then don't be alarmed that I'm only on bullet two because these last three are shorter than the first one. Um, then the... Um, Second focus here is to say not using the web as an infrastructure but using web as a source of data because of that level of social engagement and participation in the digital world that the web is bringing us. Um, so this is the program that I'm running for ESRC, Digital Social Research. Notice, going back to our co-constitution piece, the strap line, it doesn't say technology impacting society or social scientists. It says researchers harnessing technology. Really important to get the arrow that way around. Uh, not everyone would agree with that, incidentally, but th that was very important in this. This is some of the projects in the program. Multiple funding agencies, it's got bigger and bigger. The landscape's changed radically in the last couple of years. And this doesn't have everything on it because I've run out of space on the, on the weather map. Um, so that's my, my perspective here. And it would be lovely to talk about all, all the different things going on. But let's mention one of the things, and that's really looking at the new forms of data. Um, and I can't go to any event these days without there being a paper on Twitter analytics. Um, and I would just note in passing that I haven't been to any event where two papers on Twitter analytics have used the same methodology and they can't all be right. Um, and for that reason, I'm running a Twitter analytics workshop next month. And we're trying to figure out what's really going on there. This is uh, the, the tweetometer from, uh, from UCL, which uh, re re we recognize. Um, these sort of portholes appeared in a display in the, in the British Library. You could watch people tweeting in real time on a map. It's quite alarming to see the level of... Uh, of, of data that's coming out of places. It's really quite an effective um, uh, experiment subjectively. This sort of data has polarized the social science community because you can take the view of, oh, this isn't proper data, it's not fit for purpose, it wasn't collected properly, it's collected for some other purpose, um, it's not representative, it's biased, it's inconsistent, it's incomplete, you don't know if people are who they say they are, and all these issues. Or on the other hand, you can say, wow, this is amazing. We can look at research questions here that we've never looked at before. And it, you know, I, I see both of those things going on. Um, if we get better, and I think we are statistically, at dealing with issues like incomplete and inconsistent data, then that's universally applicable across many of the domains we've been looking at. What's going on in, the, in this sort of analytics area and in the area of web science, which is very interesting, is that we, we're using the data about the interactions, whether it's coming from supermarket loyalty cards or traffic cameras or smart electricity meters or Twitter or Facebook, um, and now beginning to uh, actually apply some social theory to that. There was a great paper by a colleague, not Nosh Bindraktor, um, last year where he analyzed uh, massively, massive multiplayer online game data uh, to get some theories about how people were interacting and then apply those theories with real web data. It's f fascinating stuff. Um, so I think we're beginning to get there. I think we're only halfway, but we're beginning to get there in closing the loop. Um, and actually uh, understanding, uh, or getting some understanding of what people are doing based on, on this data. Um, I mean, incidentally, um, this, is, this is part of a visualization of, of the social network that is Wikipedia. You can see here we've got William Shakespeare, Albert Einstein, Elizabeth I of England, um, um, Jesus, they're all, they're all here. Uh, um, and again, in the digital humanities perspective, great work going on looking back over social networks in literature, in diaries, how they interact with social networks today and so on. So social network analysis has become a significant method. Uh, again, looking at the co-evolution that's going on, this is looking at some linked data. Again, this is music. Um, looking at uh, another one of those big performance archives, it's called eTree from the Internet Archive. And this is linked data that's actually been linked up here with Last.fm. Um, again, we have to watch interactions, but here, going back to that social network of the data as well as the people. So what we're going to do about that at the moment, just for information, is uh, I've, I've, I'm now chairing this thing called the Web Observatory Community Group uh, for W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, 
where we're observing that <laughs> um, there are multiple web observatories being built where one way or another people are collecting data uh, and then analyzing it. Uh, and these are kind of new intermediaries. This is really important. Um, so uh, there have been up to now some sort of bilateral exchanges of web usage information, but it's getting to the point where you see some commons being created where websites are placing anonymized data uh, to make it available for others to analyze. And it's really how to describe that and how to share standards about the metadata, about the, uh, the data, and about the tools and methods that are being used. So that's one of the things going on about you know, the web as a source of data. Um, just to mention this one in passing, because it's, it's sort of about to be launched in June, so you're having a preview here. Uh, and it's a really interesting example of that web science piece and where it's going. And it comes back to the word that hasn't come up yet today, it's on this slide, clouds. Um, there's a lot of talk about this at the moment. I, this picture comes from a, um, a breakfast debate in Brussels with the, um, uh, the members from the European Commission who were involved in European cloud strategy that occurred a few weeks ago. Um, and this is my, my position <laughs> for, for that breakfast was um, actually clouds aren't an end in themselves. They're actually a symptom of a much bigger thing going on, and that's relevant to this talk because I'm talking about what are these bigger things going on. And really, this is the empowerment. This is not just um, the back office piece of high performance computing and big data. It's actually making that available to people um, to innovate over that. Uh, and other examples of that are, for example, the App Store. And what we've been seeing in the talk so far about, about Web 2 uh, so, and about user centricity and user experience. So that's all there. That's what's really going on, I think. Um, and that leads to this picture, which I hope is useful. It's a bit artificial because I can't really put any points on these axes, so forgive me. Um, but the, the idea here is that on, on the vertical axis, we have the back office piece, if you like, the increasing performance of computers, uh, the infrastructure, um, being able to deal with greater complexity of computing data. But then the other thing, the other shift I've been talking about, the increasing social complexity, the number of people who are engaged with the infrastructure that is the web. Uh, and I think sometimes we tended to focus on one of these or the other. This is kind of the Web 2 world going this way, and this is kind of our HPC world going that way. But what's really interesting now, certainly what's happening from my point of view uh, in the eResearch Center and Digital Social Research Program, is that space there where those two things come together. The crowdsourcing, for example, the citizen science, is a good example of that. Uh, so I think that's the very interesting space. That's, that, that, that's where we're going. And one interesting take on that is this notion of social machines. So up until now, computer scientists have tended to talk about things as a layer of machines and a layer of users. And some people study the machines, and some people study the users, and some people study the line in between. That's sort of HCI, which tends to be one human, one computer, one interface, but it's getting better. Social machines perspective says, instead of cutting the picture like that, why don't we cut it this way around and say, you know, Modestly, let's just rethink computer science and, and change our fundamental notion of a machine to be that socio-technical entity that is, for example, a website, the users and the interactions. And Because and, isn't that actually what the world's like? And isn't that how we actually do think about these things and talk about these things? So we've got a project starting up, a five-year project involving me from a social science viewpoint, but Edinburgh from a, a computer science viewpoint looking at formal models for this and led by um, Nigel Shadbold in Southampton, who's the government information advisor. Um, and it's gonna be very interesting to see uh, how that one pans out, but we want to observe the machines that are out there, the Web2 sites, the, the apps, um, uh, understand them, and then help engineer new ones, then release those and watch them flourish in the ecosystem or not. So that's the exercise underway there. So to finish, something about our discourse on the web. Um, Back to the notion of social objects. So this, this is quite a good one. This is a website that, uh, for which the social objects is cartoons, and one of the cartoons is about social objects, which is why I chose that. And in this talk, we talked about, for example, social networks. So that's been our social objects. So the social object is the item, the subject of the discourse that brings the social network together. And the social object of, uh, of scholarly discourse for approximately 350 years has been that thing. I think we saw a reference to philosophical transactions in Dan's presentation. Um, and okay, they've kind of gone into PDFs, but it's still, that is the granule of knowledge that we're working with in our scholarly discourse. And I just want to challenge that. And uh, there'd be a whole bunch of events 
over the last year, which you may have participated in, beyond the PDF, the Elsevier executable paper, no, executable paper Grand Challenge, Future Research Communications, which was a national event, Microsoft Research ran an event in December. So there's a lot of discussion about the future of research communications. And if there's one overarching um, idea that should come out of this talk, it's that if there's a data deluge uh, and people are doing something with it, then there's a method deluge as well. It's what they're doing with the data matters as well as the data. And everyone's suddenly become obsessed with data, which is good. Uh, but at that moment with people's attention is on the data, perhaps we should also be saying um, it's what you do with it that counts. So that's, that website, my experiment, is a good example of this. Um, we've seen an evolution of the research objects in there from uh, collecting some stuff together, like a workflow and other stuff, to describing those things. We call them research objects. Uh, we have a, a project now, whoops, let's go through this, um, called Workflow Forever, which is looking at a whole set of issues uh, that underpin that notion of research objects, it's provenance, um, this notion of um, uh, execution of the publications and interactive publications. This is a very interesting distinction between um, preserving something like in a, in a museum, putting it behind glass so you can see what happened, and conserving it, but you keep replacing the parts so you can still use it. Uh, and we can see both of those things needed in different situations. So there's a whole lot of things going on there uh, in, a, in, in, in that one of many European projects that's touching on, on this area. So my closing slide is a piece of science fiction, essentially, which is to say, once we've been this user-centric and we've created these new research objects, like those workflows that drop into the tooling of, of digital research, of, of, of e-research, then computers are going to be doing stuff with this as well. So having been user-centric for the whole talk, I'm going to close by going machine-centric and say machines are users as well. And some of this stuff can happen automatically. When you, you publish your paper or your PhD thesis um, electronically in the digital library, new data comes along, you can press a button and run it, or it can just have the button pressed automatically, new stuff comes out. You can see this sort of science organism, this research organism beginning to grow, beginning to be autonomic. Uh, this isn't too much like science fiction. There's evidence of a number of these things happening already. It raises a whole set of interesting issues. So I'll leave you with that. And uh, all these slides are available online, so you can you're welcome to look at them in, in more detail. I'm happy to discuss any of it, but those are the, the closing challenges that correspond to the four sections of the talk. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.